What we've got here is one of the most important buildings in Britain, and it's right here in Lincolnshire. Basically, as you see, it does look, it's a rare building. It's got the crow step gables. In this country, that's what we commonly call them. There are many names right through the various different countries, say, for instance, in Holland or in Sweden. But commonly, an English uh, usage, if we say the step gable, but we like our vernacular because the crows sits on them. And what's that symbolising is basically the whole of the um, Northern Renaissance. Now, by that I mean, usually when one hears the word Renaissance, they immediately think of Italy. But after it left Italy, which was it was mainly patro- um, papal patronage, and came north, what we had were the rich Burgundian dukes. Flanders was the richest place in Europe. And, of course... Years later, when it was brought about the Hanseatic League, as we get trade, we get culture. And so we can see all of those ports which were frequented by the Hanseatic League in Germany, Poland, uh, Gdansk, which the German word used to be um, Danzig, and uh, Visby in Sweden bits of Denmark that now belongs to Sweden because they went head to head and lost the day and um, we're very lucky to have this because Cheapside was the first high street in England and you would see these buildings along there but of course after the first great fire there were no more now we are off the beaten track and obviously we've survived so this stands as one of the early ex- earliest examples of this architecture. But how did this architecture find its way from, from Europe to Great Ponton? Well, the man who built this, Anthony Ellis, it's credited for building this. Now, the Ellis family came from Swineshead, just outside of Boston. There were wool merchants. He was a merchant of the staple of Calais. Of course, Calais was a part of Flanders but it was run by us, the English. It was the only licensed port for getting wool into the Low Countries. Now, we had some of the best wool in Europe. 50% of the wool on the continent came from England. And so we see some of the most fabulous tapestries in the world. If last year anyone took advantage of the anniversary of Henry VIII, the 500th year, and went to Hampton Court, they would have seen some of the most spectacular tapestries, all made down in Flanders, from this wall. Before we go inside, tell me about the church behind us and and the, the weather vane. Well, the weather vane, which was erected in around 1820 or thereabout, it said there was a fiddler who used to frequent the village. And um, he was trying to make his way to the Americas. And he became unwell. The villagers were kind to him and looked after him. And he did make his way to the Americas. And he'd never forgotten the villagers. And so he came back and erected that fiddle as a thank you. Now, it's blown off of the, those are the crocketed finials. It's blown down on three occasions. We've only ourselves witnessed it once because we've only lived in the village now for just over a quarter of a century. Now, on the, at the time we witnessed it, the Prince Williams of Gloucester Army Barracks came and they abseiled down the uh, finials and re-erected it. But we're told that the first time it came down, the old um, thick brown bottles we used to see, it revolved on the bottom of one of those, and it had worn through as thin as brown paper. So um, it just goes to show how much friction's created from it swiveling about. But, but it's a very famous tower because the tower was built by the man who built the house, Anthony Ellis. And his coat of arms, it's embellished all around the tower. And it also has what is quite possibly the earliest bespectacled gargoyle in the land. And we think it's him. And the reason for that, in all of his wills, it does say he was partially sighted or blind. So it seems an apt way to demonstrate that. Can we have a look inside? Yes, indeed. (laughs) 
Though it's partitioned now, all of this was open into a small medieval hall. There's a pivotal date, 1921, where it became a rectory house. This is what I term the domestication, because obviously they've divided up space to get more living accommodation. And of course we see, and usually with this house, whereas the vernacular of this country, it's very low ceiling. These are quite high ceiling, and it's still not its true height. It was said to be 21 feet from floor to ceiling. So you had a typical late medieval house, windows are high, shafting light downwards to diffuse the light. When they arrive, they're apparently having fallen in love with it, thinking it would make a lovely rectory because of its juxtaposition to church. They realize they could not see into the gardens. So they've raised the floors, and also now they can see out, but of course they've now got a cavity, and that enables them to bypass the use of the medieval fireplaces. And so, as we walk around, you'll see some of the fireplaces that would make most castles proud. We actually do have permission from English Heritage to scoop all this out, should we wish, to regain the main hall. But that remains to be seen, because we have a huge task ahead of us. So how many people would have lived here in, uh, when it was originally built? Very difficult to say, because again... Um, you know, the house is architecturally, we look at it and it's obviously high status. So how it was um, occupied is very difficult, whereas with very vernacular Tudor buildings, you can say that, um, yes, they brought the animals in to share warmth and that. But I very much doubt if that's the sort of thing that went on here. We're looking at um, the new middle classes. And so they were cash rich manageable dwelling, and they were embellishing. That is just the most astonishing fireplace. I mean, you talk about walk-in fireplaces. I'm 6'2", and I can walk <laughs> right. in there easily. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, there's a now We restored this. The whole of that was bricked up. And there was a tiniest um, Victorian, the, for you get the three lumps of coal. Now, we went through all the local, the paraphernalia of... Um, doing this sort of thing one does need to do that with a listed building and we then got the go ahead and took all of this out and another usual see upstairs which is absolutely amazing when i looked on your website i read with interest about the paintings on the walls now they're upstairs aren't they that's correct can we have a look at this yes indeed thank you and it's a further leaves upside down mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the latest staircase from the 17th century. Now, so, I would have to say that these are not paintings on the walls as in frames. These are the walls that have been painted. Yes, wall paintings. Not frescoes, but wall paintings. Now, this is said to be the most important and complete late medieval wall paintings in the country. Now, what makes them so incredibly important? They're not ecclesiastical, they're domestic. So again, it gives a social history of what's happening here. There's still a lot of colour here. Uh, there are obviously trees that looks like some kind of shield. What actually is there on these walls? Well, when Pevsner first encountered these, he likened them to French Vidure tapestries. Vidure being the word, the French word for green. So yes, there's an abundance of trees. Green was never the strongest colour. So it hasn't survived as strongly as the red, which is. But what we see, it's rather like you're within looking out of a loggia. Thus, the, there are columns every seven feet apart. And beneath the trees, there's a deer. And then there's a peacock, a fox. Do you oh, see yes, I can see it. Now there? you're pointing it out. I can see right. it. Right. And if you look very closely, the light's not good. There's actually a bird, rather like a pelican's beak in its mouth. So that tells us it's a part of the fable, Reynard. Now, these are dated from circa 1500, currently. And I say currently because there'll always be conjecture about this sort of thing. When they were first found in about 1930, 
They, were, they thought they were about 14th century. 